chairman of the board of Caravanserai Project and one of the founders, and I want to officially welcome you all here. It's a very interesting group of people. We have folks from, we have people from, I'm getting an echo. Uh, we have people from uh, Canada and Spain and all over the United States. Uh, we have a lot of folks who've been in our programs before and a lot of folks who are brand new to participating in some of our activities. So it's really good to see everybody and to uh, uh, meet all the new people. Uh, on the screen also is Mihai Patru, who is our CEO and co-founder as well. Uh, and then our staff, uh, Bradley uh, Chargaloff, who is kind of doing the logistics this morning. And your host, Supreme, uh, is going to be Gabriel, um, Graciela Moran. And we're uh, very delighted to have everybody here. This has been a topic that um, a lot of people have been concerned about and talking about, particularly in light of uh, different kinds of government funding in response to uh, COVID, in response to work on anti-racism. And people are saying, you know, what, what, what kind of relationships do we need to have? How do we have relationships with the folks who are going to be making so many decisions about program design, about how money is going to flow, uh, about policies around justice and around supporting infrastructure of not-for-profits and the kind of programs and services we provide. So this is really in response to many conversations and requests that we've had. So we're very excited. We want to uh, thank our uh, speakers this morning for being with us. Uh, it's a very interesting group of folks, I think you will find. And so I'm going to turn this over to Graciela, who will um, 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 be the uh, ho host for the, for the presentations this morning. Graciela, uh, please uh, go ahead. I think um, we're far enough along that we probably know need to go ahead and get started. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Stephen, um, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and I'm so excited for everyone to be here. One of the things that we've been really much, oh, my name is Graciela Moran. I serve as the external affairs officer for Caravansary Project. And I'm a, a resident in the Inland Empire in Fontana specifically. Um, I just want to know, I am um, in an, a location where my internet may cut off. So Stephen, will, if that happens, Stephen will go ahead and take over. Um, but we're super excited to have a great um, panel um, to share their experiences. And we just wanna thank them, especially since we are coming at the end of the month in the holiday season. And I wanna thank all of y'all for joining us as I know that it is a Friday. And so we can tell that your passion and your, um, and your motivation to be here and to push forward and continue being change makers. So thank you so much for being here. I wanna just go ahead and, and, and just let's get started with a couple of our our panels and have them introduce themselves and um, share um, share a little bit about them, um, what they're doing. They're really great folks. And I really encourage y'all to get in touch with them after this call, if y'all have any further questions. Um, and so we'll go ahead and start off with, Denise is right here at, um, at the top of my, my screen. So Denise, go ahead and um, introduce yourself, talk a little bit about yourself and, um, and let our um, attendees know who you are. Good morning, everyone. I am so happy to be here with you today. I'm Denise Davis. I'm a council member in the city of Redlands. I was elected in 2018. Um, I have to say, I never thought I would be in elected office, but the 2016 presidential election was a real turning point for me and inspired me and I think many other people out there to get involved in our local communities and in, in politics at every level. Um, and really here, because I'm focused on social justice, equity, and making a difference for the people in my community. I was the first openly LGBT council member elected in the city of Redlands and uh, I'm proud of the work that we've been able to do in the last three years and, and happy to be on this esteemed panel with some good friends of mine. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Denise. I appreciate that. Sam, go ahead and introduce yourself. We're super excited to have you. Thanks. Uh, happy to be here as well too. I'm Sam Chasen. I uh, am based out in Washington, D.C., and I work for the YMCA of the USA on our government relations team. So um, we are part of the, na the National Resource Office that supports the 2,700 YMCAs around the country. Um, we have about 8 million kids in programs, 20 million folks overall, and each Y is a little bit different, uh, doing their own community-facing work. Um, 
and oftentimes, well, it's always in a in an elected official's district uh, at the local level, at the state level, and then also federally, um, and uh, helping to tell those stories in a um, comprehensive and compelling way, and helping wise make sure that they're asking for what they need, and um, making sure that the elected officials are able to um, streamline supports to get to YMCA's. So. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, before I worked for the Y um, in this government affairs capacity, I worked on Capitol Hill uh, for about four and a half years. I worked uh, for Senator uh, Jack Reed and for Congressman Jim Langevin and briefly for Congressman Mark Bocan uh, in an intern uh, capacity. Um, and before that, I used to teach middle school. So I, I'm really happy to still be um, working it for an organization that prioritizes the well-being and uh, learning and joy of children. It's nice to be here with many um, friends and I'm excited for the conversation today. Thank you so much, Sam, and we're excited to, to hear your perspectives. Um, Italia, if you'll, um, go ahead and introduce yourself. We're super excited to have you. Hi, yes, everyone. Uh, good morning, and you'll have to excuse my voice. I'm getting over a cold, so just uh, glad that, you know, that's getting over with. But good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Italia Garcia, and I currently serve as one of uh, the senators, uh, our state senator of California, Senator Richard Roth's. Uh, field representative, and it's been a pleasure to be uh, in his team. Uh, prior to me joining uh, his office, I worked primarily in the nonprofit sector, and that was actually uh, primarily because of my immigration status. I uh, was born in Mexico, and I came here as an undocumented immigrant uh, since the age of 10, and it was until recently that I was able to adjust my status and have further uh, work opportunities, right, but I was primarily in the nonprofit sector uh, doing a lot of advocacy work around immigration, immigrant rights, labor uh, rights, edu higher education, uh, environmental justice. And uh, that really has been what drives um, my work, my passion, uh, everything that I do. Uh, it really derives from community organizing, from community advocacy and civic engagement. Um, I participated in a lot of our local and statewide uh, work around elections and making sure that um, undocumented folks also knew how they can play a role in our civic engagement process and helping people become citizens. I think that's one of the biggest highlights um, of my career when, you know, there's folks that were at some point undocumented, then they became residents and then they became citizens uh, and then they're able to vote. And so for me, that was uh, one of the biggest things to really uh, take away from, from my community organizing time. And so it's been a pleasure really, and I look forward to the conversation. It's so good to see some familiar faces. Thank you so much, Italia. We appreciate you. And we're very excited to hear that perspective and um, answer the questions. And last but not least, I promise, um, Adan, we're so excited to have you. Um, please go ahead and, and, and introduce yourself. Of course. Thank you so much, Graciela. And I'll go ahead and make this quick so we can get you know started on the juicy stuff. But hi, everybody. Happy Friday and good morning. Adan here. I currently serve as the California State and Local Lead for the U.S. Politics and Government Outreach Team at Meta. But before I I was at Meta, which, by the way, we're still sort of getting used to the name change here. I used to serve as the Deputy Director of Civic Engagement at the Naleo Educational Fund, which, in case all of you are not familiar, is the National Association of Latino Elected Appointed Officials. Outside of sort of our association, our association work and what we're sort of known for there, you know, we also do sort of everything in the gamut of civic engagement from helping people become U.S. naturalized citizens all the way to supporting them to run for office, but we're seeing many Latinos be successful in their contests. And so there I was leading a couple of campaigns from, you know, getting Inland Empire residents and Latino, um, Latinos into the California Redistricting Commission and to making sure we were turning out Latinos and sort of all kinds of vulnerable communities out to the vote. And of course, at the end, you know, making sure we had a accurate and precise decennial census. And, you know, at first I started doing some regional work there, whereas where it was, where I met so many people on the line now. And, you know, we were working with our partners to really achieve a full and accurate count for the Inland Empire. Many of you who work there, live there, play there, know how desperately we need some of those resources. So I was, you know, very honored to be a key part of that work. But that being said, super excited to be here and, you know, get to learn from everybody on the, on the line as well. Thank you so much, Adan. We, we're super excited to learn more. Um, and before I know, um, if y'all ever, if y'all have to leave the call or anything, this call will be recorded. And a lot of our folks um, listening, they do come back and, and, and um, access the recording. So it's free for you all to access and send over. Um, and this webinar is brought to 
um, is made possible in part by the generous support of the Wells Fargo Open for Business Fund. Um, so we're really grateful for this fund um, to make sure that we can have this made possible. So let's go ahead and how Adan said, let's get into the juicy stuff and let's, and let's talk a little bit about it. And we're gonna make it very interactive and have it conversational. Um, if you have any questions, we'll have a Q and A um, at, the, at the end of the session. And yeah, all righty. So let's go ahead and kind of start off with the, the first question. Um, we want to make sure so the audience knows a little bit about more about yourselves and what's your motivation? Uh, what led you to this direction where you are now? Are there a specific set of skills, steps that you needed to, to get to where you are today? And whoever wants to, whoever wants to start, you're more than welcome to. I know we're very eager. <laughs> I'll go ahead and jump in, in there and we'll sort of start backwards here. But, you know, before I was at the Naleo Educational Fund, which is sort of the capacity I'm going to be talking about today, I was at a sister organization, Unidos US, formerly known as the National Council of La Raza. And at the time, we were working on reforming the criminal justice system in California because, you know, at the end of the day, we were seeing that people were being not jailed for the crimes that they were committing, but instead for sort of the size of their wallets. And this, of course, disproportionately impacted Black and Brown people. But just like in any campaign, once we were sort of able to get to the end there, of course, the campaign ended. And I was looking to see, you know, what I sort of could do next. I knew that I wanted to sort of continue leveraging the resources of a national organization who was doing work at the local level, particularly around building sort of nonprofit capacity. But I still wanted to do work that was sort of policy advocacy related, where, you know, we would get to sort of elevate the concerns of local nonprofits to elected officials. Again, you know, sort of building their capacity there to, you know, provide them with the needed talking points, the needed technical assistance, just the needed education to make their lives a little bit easier to engage in this advocacy. But I also very much sort of enjoyed the comms aspect to it, whether it was spokesperson comms or just being able to target, you know, ads on Facebook so we can commit people to action and call their legislator, right? So I knew I wanted to sort of continue doing this advocacy work, especially at a national organization. And I knew one day, you know, having you know, growing up in Moreno Valley, attended high school in Riverside, I knew I wanted to go back to my community, make a difference. Like many of the people on the line, we sort of understand the issues firsthand, but then at the same time, you just feel sort of the commitment to give back and, you know, make the Inland Empire, Riverside, San Bernardino County is a little bit of a better place for everybody. And, you know, funny enough, of course, it was sort of the right place, right time, right people. You know, the sister org, Naleo Educational Fund started hiring because they were building out sort of their census program. And I, I didn't know much about the census. In fact, the last time the census happened, I think I was like 12 or 13. But you know, what I did know was that this was sort of a great opportunity to bring resources back into the community. And many of us know how desperately some of those resources are needed, but also sort of tying it back to the policy sort of discussion. With the census, we get an opportunity to get like really powerful data about our communities. And this data is so important when it comes to, you know, focusing on different discrepancies, whether it be voting rights, housing, education, and seeing how groups are able to uh, attain or not attain some of these things, right? And so, you know, I was really lucky that, you know, my sort of boss entrusted me with this opportunity. And, you know, at the time we were, of course, working on building sort of nonprofit capacity. I was working with elected officials, you know, uh, community organizations, school boards, just everybody sort of in the government projects and advocacy space. And, you know, my job was to provide them with the resources, the technical assistance, the, you know, the education and, you know, just other critical support they wouldn't otherwise have gotten if, you know, organizations like ours hadn't invested in the region. And so, you know, I think, you know, the, the sort of opportunity to do good and the sort of commitment to make our communities better and just to make an overall difference, I think, is why I do sort of the work here and, you know, whether it's sort of in the private or public sector, this is, I think, always going to be sort of a key value of mine. Thank you so much, Adan. You touched a lot on the public service value and being of commitment. So thank you so much for touching on that. Denise um, or Sam or Italia, would you like to add on to, um, I'll add to that and answer that question? I'd love to hear. Yeah, go ahead, Denise. Thank you. Absolutely. That's a great question. And I immediately thought about um, my experience, I came to Redlands as the first person in my family to attend a four-year university, and I was in a program there where students design their own majors. And so a big overarching question when you're thinking about designing your own major is, what is it that you're passionate about? What do you want to do with your life? 
And for me, like I mentioned in my intro, social justice and equity was really the answer to that question. Um, I've spent my career working for the last 15 years in higher education in various capacities. And um, the piece of your question about what skill sets are required to do this work, uh, I think relationship building is a really important skill set. And, and for me, I, I'm sort of an extrovert, introvert, getting more introverted the older I get. But I, I think naturally I've been an extrovert. And um, what's helped me develop relationships to get into elected office is just the fact that I've spent time in coffee shops, right? I spent time in my local community, getting to know people, getting to know the issues of the community, building those relationships with my baristas and the people who work at the restaurants and just getting to know these people um, on an intimate level. And then I think that, you know, when I said I'm running for office, people said, we're gonna show up and support you, right? You already know the issues that are happening in our community and um, had a great fundraiser last night with a lot of the local business owners that I've been frequenting uh, over the years. And so I think for me, it's been about relationship building um, and being really mission driven and being focused on why I'm doing this work. And, uh, and it always circles back again to improving lives and uh, making this a more inclusive place to live. Thank you so much, Denise. You brought up a really great point of you don't have to be extroverted to be to run for um, for local um, for a local office position. It's that's a very that's a very good point. And maybe someone can ask a question about that later in the end, because I'm actually very curious on what that how that looks like, because I think a lot of folks are afraid um, if they're not as social and they don't, you know, and they feel the, the anxiety. How do I take that next step? So that's a really great point. Sam, I see you, you, that you unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. And uh, what the two uh, previous speakers said really resonated with me a lot as well. But uh, a lot of drive around um, service contribution, um, being civically involved and community engaged, have always been kind of backbones. I mentioned in the in the intro, I you know even from a young age when I was like a camp counselor, or tutor, mentor, I've just always been sort of um, been motivated around youth and you know youth voice, but also just helping. Um, kids have fun, joyful learning experiences. And so that's kind of been one theme that is a consistent motivator for me. Um, certainly when I was working around these topics for elected officials. Uh, and then also uh, now in the work that I do to kind of, um, again, kind of up, uplift kids and families and, and help provide them support wherever possible. So I definitely think when we're, you know, us as nonprofits, um, when we're thinking of our um, other organizations too, but our, our mission really drives us. And so that's one that's resonated and, and carried me through and definitely makes me feel like I'm contributing and making a difference. Uh, I know the question was also talking about different skills um, or mindsets that we found beneficial in our work. And it's always interesting. Uh, I think some things that stand out to me, it's always interesting to think about um, in the current work that I do in the advocacy space and similarly in previous roles, how far um, kind of a customer service attitude has gone, which is something I think I really picked up um, when I was a waiter or other service jobs that I did, uh, you know, answering phones and working the front desk of my college and university, um, you know, but to be customer focused uh, and then also to um, be solutions oriented. So to um, try to solve problems, but be really asset based. Like sometimes we at the Y, we can be pretty corny, but um, to, you know, think in statements that are positive and, uh, you know, what we're asking for, not what we're pushing against. And um, yeah, so I think those were the two. Uh, I had one third one I was going to say, but it slipped my mind. It's okay, we could come back to it. And I'm, I'm excited to thank you so much for, um, for sharing that. And it's not corny, by the way, I think sometimes we do need, we need that, that love and, and spirit. Italia, go, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think um, folks touched on, on really good points. I think, and I, I kind of mentioned this in my intro, right? Some of the things that uh, really have motivated me has been the community, right? For me, coming from uh, a community-based organizations and coming from uh, immigrant families and, and growing up in, in poor communities out here in the Inland Empire, it really, you see the need in the community. And I think that's what always keeps me going, right? The fact that I saw personally in my communities and in my families, the fact that we were being affected by public policy changes, the fact that they were uh, there's there was a lack of or 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 not of um, you know support in our communities, and I think for me that's when I realized I needed to make sure that you know I got involved, that I empowered others to get involved, and to make sure that we had changes. I remember you know back in the days you know folks here in California that were undocumented didn't have driver's license, right? They didn't have a lot of things that 
now we have and you know we just see them as you know how did we not have those things right but it took a lot of advocacy it took a lot of organizing it took a lot of community building and really lifting up those voices of people that have been disenfranchised by systems of oppression and by you know a lot of other uh, barriers right and so for me that continues to be the case and in terms of skills, I think one of the, the things that I've seen over time is has been to be strategic, right? I think a lot of the times we all have a lot of passion. We all bring a lot of expertise, but a lot of times we're not really sure what direction to take when it comes to uh, the next steps, right? Or even looking, you know, a couple of steps ahead, right? Understanding the political climate, it's so important. Understanding the players in the region, understanding the players abroad, right? I think that's something that, you know, I've, I've seen that my colleagues, you know, Denise has done really well as, as, a, as um, a council member, mayor in Redlands, right, and other folks, that you really have to make sure that you are strategic in what you do, because otherwise, you know, you're just, you're not going to get very far, right, and I think that goes to also, you know, networking, we all know the, the importance of networking and building those relationships, and so uh, those are one of the things that I'd like to highlight. Thank you so much, Italia, you brought up a really great point networking and I guess navigating um, through um, through wanting to get what you want. So I guess this goes to the next question a little bit. Um, how do you navigate through working with government elected officials and nonprofits? Um, I'd like y'all to maybe share an experience and please feel free to keep it as confidential as you'd like. You don't have to name anything. Um, whether it's a good or, or a bad experience that you've had navigating it, if, it, if this experience inspired you um, to, to be in the role that you're at? And what should that dynamic look like? How can, um, especially a lot of our attendees here are in the nonprofit sector or, or supporting um, directors. Um, they're looking to, to know how to, what that dynamic should look like. So I'm gonna maybe leave it open, maybe to Denise Italia, um, if y'all wanna start off. Sure, absolutely. I'm thinking about examples um, in yeah. my head at the moment, but but I think that for me, the the outreach that has been done by nonprofits has been great. Um, people will reach out through my city email, and and you know, for a lot of us who are on local city councils, this is our part time job. We have full time jobs, and so if we don't get back to you right away, it's because there's a lot uh, going on otherwise. And so, if people have been creative and have messaged me on Instagram and you know, I'm pretty quick to get back on Instagram. And I think that's been a great strategy for nonprofits is to reach out to me on social media, which has been um, really helpful. There was a nonprofit in particular that uh, wanted to do basketball court murals in Redlands, a really exciting project, but it was at a sort of tricky time for us because it was right before uh, the November election where we were asking voters to approve a 1% sales tax measure. And so some of my colleagues said, well, if we're spending money on this, um, you know, the, that this, this project that wasn't already in the budget, how is that going to look to voters? And I, I was still in support of the project regardless, um, but it was a tricky project in terms of the timing. I think generally speaking, most people on the council supported the project. So I guess my advice would be think about the timing, think about the budget situation of the city or uh, the entity that you're approaching. Um, sometimes there are better moments to make an ask than others. And actually with that particular project, we ended up still pushing it through and they were trying to find external sources of funding, doing fundraisers. And we were committed to making it happen one way or another, but afterwards, after we got the sales tax measure passed, thankfully, I was able to talk with the city manager and say, we really need to reimburse them for some of these costs that were well above what they had fundraised for. Um, so we were able to do that, and I'm grateful that we were able to do that. Um, that's just one example. There are many examples like that, but I would say timing is everything, and it's helpful to build relationships with your electeds in, in different capacities. I'm really glad that you mentioned that um, y'all are part-time, because I think that a lot of folks think that this is a, a full, you know, you're on call all the time, you're checking your emails consistently. And um, so thank you for letting our, our, our audience know. And also too, I'm learning a couple of things too. So I appreciate it. If anyone else wants to add to, the, to this conversation on, you know, how do you navigate working through, you know, government elected officials? I see Italia un unmuted. So go ahead, Italia. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to now have sort of the, the two sides of, of experience, right? I think when you're in the nonprofit sector, 
um, you you really see you know government and elected officials as you know you you have a really you do have a due diligence to the community to hold them accountable right and I think that is what continue should continue to to happen right but I think nonetheless even when I was at the nonprofit uh, especially you know being in a national nonprofit a lot of times uh, we're very disconnected from the local work right and so you really need that specific folks on the ground to understand the political savviness of things right and I think understanding that sometimes you know speaking to a staff member in an office right is going to be perhaps as more more effective than uh you know perhaps doing it and, and this is not to diminish right any community work right but you know perhaps you know if you're doing a picket right you want to make sure that hey you know if you're doing a strike outside outside of their office right or some things of that sort that you want to make sure that there's a sort of communication with that those legislative offices right that you are also um being direct with them in the sense of, of what you want a lot of the times it's, it's hard to relay that information because you know in our communities the advocacy work that we do we have a lot of asks right we we want a lot of changes to get done but you have to be strategic in who is going to be the most accurate person to carry your to champion your efforts right and it might not be your legislator in your specific area it might be somebody else who's more passionate another legislator or another elected official who's more passionate about your issue area than your own member. And I think that's something that a lot of times we don't understand. We just expect our elected officials to get everything that we want done. And it might not always be feasible, right? I think nonetheless, there's always going to be that, um, we should always have that sense of accountability towards, towards you know folks, but still being a strategic, I think it really comes back to that. And I think a lot of the a lot of the times um, when we're doing community advocacy and, and relating with you know government agencies, I think it, the networking and the relationship building, I can't stress that enough, it's so key, right? Because that's really gonna open up a lot of opportunities, a lot of doors of conversations that, uh, that you know, need to happen, right? And that you wanna make sure that you continue to push for your advocacy efforts. And so, uh, you know, to, to Denise's point, right? A lot of times specifically our local electeds, they're part-time, you know, in, they're in a part-time capacity, school board members right now, they're getting attacked so much because of everything that's happening specifically here in California with a lot of mandates and, and you know, COVID and all that. And we have to understand that a lot of the times, you know, things are outside of their jurisdiction, right? Things are, you know, coming down from, from the top kind of thing. And so understanding those, the, the, what they can actually do, who can do what, and, you know, who can advocate for what specifically is key. That way we're being strategic, we're targeting the right people at the right time you know denise touched on the timing right i think those are all critical things it's like tackling the person the right person at the right time it's very very key and i think that's where the community building comes in because if somebody you know runs into their council member you know at city hall or whatever have you you know it's very important that they build those relationships right that community feels that these people are accountable to them and that there is that relationship between them and i think Having, you know, here in Southern California, we've had a lot of political changes that have benefited the community. And that has really, we've seen the, the benefits of that. We are reaping the benefits of those things. You know, we're having in Riverside specifically, right? We had a change in council, a drastic change in council and that has really shifted the policies that we're seeing now. And so those are all things that really the community plays a role in and the community and the nonprofits specifically play a role in because they're able to really connect one-on-one -on -one with those relationships and with those folks. Sounds great, Italia. I do see Stephen um, un unmuted. Did you want to ask a follow-up question to Italia? I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> no, I, you know, I'm, I'm listening to this and kind of making a list of uh, some of the key things. And I, I thought it was interesting that, you know, uh, you got to find your champions. And I, and it's not always your legislative, you're elected, you know, and, and I always found in my work that sometimes the most unlikely people were my champions. Oh. And it was paying attention to who they were and what their interests were. I thought that was really strong. I also really liked your comment about you need to be present in your own community. So your elected officials see you. They run into you, you speak to them, you, uh, you know, and, and, and you don't just ask, you sometimes support. 
And of course, I love your social action about, well, if we're doing a, a demonstration out in front of their offices, let them know. That, that kind of warmed the cockles of my heart, it's being an anti-war activist from the 60s. So, <laughs> but uh, very smart. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Graciela. Yeah, of course. I, I see that. No, 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 please, please always. Uh, I see Adan. I, Adan was doing um, a couple of that of those with um, seeing Stephen uh, in his comments. Go ahead, Adan. Yeah, funny enough, I was actually going to mention some of these things. So I'll go ahead and jump in here just because Italia talked about sort of national nonprofits. And I'll just say sort of from the top in here that like the way you want to speak to electeds or interact with them is how you want to like have like friendships with your actual friends, right? Like you want to have a friend before you need a friend, right? And you want to have a genuine friendship so that your friend comes through for you right and just like a friend you show up for them and you're helpful as much as possible right because you know denise mentioned this already like electeds are you know sort of working across so many issues and running on fumes sometimes they can't be experts at everything and they can't do everything so they love 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 when you can provide them with talking points when you can provide them with technical assistance when you can send them you know research or briefing materials right and that is a great way to make yourself valuable and keep yourself top of mind. So when something hits the fan, guess who they're picking up the phone to call? You, right? And so, you know, to sort of make this a little bit more specific, you know, I was coming in with a national organization that, you know, hadn't really preserved their relationships from the last census, right? And that was like, what, 10, 12 years ago? And so... We lost it then. I think we did. I think we we could we let me send him a message. Yeah, you froze up. Yeah. We can come back to it because I, I definitely think it's very valuable because he, he was right on the on the point of of I guess the the, the next question as well. Um, and this can be framed specifically to Italia and Denise. Um, what is the expectation for, and also as well, Sam, because Sam did work as well on the Hill, what is the expectation for mission-driven sectors and nonprofits best approach, uh, the do's and the don'ts, especially um, making a little bit more specific for small organizations that can afford a lobbyist, um, what should they do, especially our, my role, there's a lot of nonprofits that can't, aren't at the capacity yet to have an external affairs officer or, or only have volunteers. But actually, we before we get to that question, Adan just um, came back to us. It's okay, Adan. <laughs> Sorry, of course the internet will drop when you get to sort of the good stuff. It's like the Zoom that are, you know, plotting against my favor here. But, you know, I'll sort of keep this short here. But, you know, I met with all these people and it was a super easy intro meeting before I even needed anything. I'm like, this is who I am. This is who the org is. This is what we're doing. This is what we're gonna do. What are your thoughts? How can we be helpful? And, you know, I think the real big skill in this work is being able to listen. Everyone's going to sort of identify different needs to you, even if they don't do so explicitly, right? And that way you sort of jot them down in your little notes pad so that a month, a quarter, a year from now, before you even need them, this was back like in what, 2019, a year at the census, I was sort of getting it, I was making an inventory of who wanted to do what. So then I could follow up and be like, well, you're going to do this, here you go. Or like, actually, I'm thinking about you because we heard the community wants this and I know you wanted to do something similar. So I'm sort of re-upping that, reconnecting with you, right? And sometimes, you know, people are gonna be super down, right? And they're gonna wanna do something with you off the bat. Sometimes they're not, but don't just discount or disqualify someone who might not be a likely ally. Definitely work with the very likely allies. But what I've seen is that sometimes for good or worse, people will come to you 11th hour and they'll be like, hey, we wanna do something. And if you didn't discount them, guess what? The sort of bridge and the door is open for that sort of opportunity. So that's what I would say. You definitely want to be proactive. People hate being asked to do stuff. And when, especially when there's no relationship there and having an authentic relationship, right? Feeding people information, being helpful, inviting them to a training, inviting them to events. People appreciate this stuff, right? And it can be the smallest thing that can really make sort of the longest long-term difference here. Thank you so much of them. That was very valuable. And I saw I see our attendees writing this down and just nodding their heads because I think as um, as um, representatives, we get stuck on how do we reach out? And I think it's just that that key introduction of just letting them know who you are and 
the, you know, how beneficial it could be for both parties. So let's go to that next question really quick. Um, Sam, did you wanna- uh, uh, Graciela, just a yeah. second. Why don't you, you ask a piece that I'd love to hear these guys yeah. talk about a little bit more is about what you do not do. Yes, there we go. That's a great question. What do, do we, what shouldn't we do? Um, and that's a, whoever wants to start it off, um, that'd be great. Sam, I'm, I'm really curious, um, since you were on the Hill, especially um, working with congressional folks, um, what were some mistakes that you saw that, that maybe can fit that don't criteria? Well, I'll, I'll kind of cheat because I'll uh, do a double negative, but um, really what Atalia said resonated with me too. <clears throat> what you need to do is have an ask. What you don't want to do is come in with without that. So you want to make sure that you know, you're know you sharing your mission, you're telling your story, you're making the member um, or the staffer familiar with your work. But at the end of the day, when you leave that meeting, are they going to know what you want for them? And it's totally fine to have you. I mean, you have to build and start relationships somewhere. So a get to know you is totally appropriate. And I think uh, Denise shared and Stephen mentioned too about being available and around in the community. But um, I think, you know, when I worked in the staff capacity and what I, I work with um, the current uh, wise that I support now is around like specifically, what are you in search of? Is it federal funding or is it financial support? And if so, is it a way in which the federal government supports nonprofits, right? Um, and if not, maybe you can think beyond that box, but just being as specific as possible. I definitely felt myself in a lot of meetings where I was like, that was a great meeting. And um, I'm not sure if they need anything from us. Sounds like they're doing pretty well. So um, <laughs> I would just encourage uh, as specific as you can to see what you need. And um, I think someone mentioned earlier, but to you know be asking for things that are in the scope of support that an elected official can offer. That's really great. Thank you so much, Sam. And I guess we could go now to the, the next question that we that we had asked, but we were all left with suspense then. So that's why when we saw you, we were like, we, let's jump back in. <laughs> but um, so this can be framed for everyone, um, but what is the expectation for mission-driven sectors, um, you know, for nonprofits, especially the, not, the small organizations? You know, we talked a little bit about it. I just want to um, re-ask it. Um, for those who can't afford a lobbyist, can't afford an external affairs director, officer, what should they do um, when they're in those places, especially um, because it is very tough to get a grant as a nonprofit and the process of what that can look like. And a lot of the times it's, you know, the director and a lot of the time you have volunteers putting in um, and helping out because they believe in the mission. Um, what are you, what's the expectation? Yeah. Maybe, yeah, Denise, I was about to to, to pick on you right now. <laughs> Sure. Thank you so much. I'll go back to what Sam was saying about having a clear ask. That's really important. Uh, I think especially, you know, COVID was a rough time for a lot of cities. We did a lot of layoffs last year and we're just rebuilding our staff at the moment, but they're um, short staffed and overstretched. And so the, the clearer the ask you can present, the better, the more chance that the city manager will say, yes, this is doable. And the council will say, yes, we can vote this in. Um, I'm just recognizing that a lot. We still haven't recovered fully from the early days of the pandemic staffing wise. Um, and you know, I've seen some really great proposals. There's a, there's a person right now who's proposing to do a, an art demonstration garden and she's done a lot of the legwork already talking with relevant city staff members and the fire marshal. And that's harder to say no to when this person's already gone out and done the research. She's even identified external funding sources and grant opportunities. Um, so that's really helpful if you've done your research and you come with a clear proposal, uh, make it really hard for the council to say no, basically, is, is my advice in that situation. Thank you so much, Denise. That was a really great answer. Sam, I see that you unmuted. Go ahead. Well, I, I was also, also kind of thinking around um, the power of coalitions and, and shared missions and you know, even all of us on this call, well, maybe not, not all, but, you know, if you identify as a nonprofit, that can be one um, group that shares goals, maybe it's around charitable deductions or whatnot. But, you know, all the work that I do um, and the work that I see successfully done is done in partnership with like-minded organizations who have similar interests. And I, and I understand that most people on this, you know, I, I might be wearing four hats, but most people in this call are wearing 15 hats. And it's really um, 
hard to prioritize the work, but I know there can be big returns and to depend on your neighbors. And, you know, even this is a networking event in a sense. So to, um, you know, I like to, I have a very broad definition of who I consider in my network, like you all are in my network now. And, um, you know, to kind of use that to our advantage to, um, yeah, elevate shared goals. You bring up such a great point of network. It's a funny conversation that me and Mihai once had. Um, we just follow everyone on LinkedIn. Some people call it stalking. Some, um, we call it strategic planning and research. <laughs> um, but if anyone else wants to add in, I see Adan going like this. I, I, it's really important to add everyone on, on LinkedIn and, you know, and definitely have everyone in your network. And I think just this call, you know, I encourage all of y'all um, to reach out, like how I mentioned in the beginning, if you have follow-up questions. Um, and if if anyone wants to add in, if not, we can move into the next question. Uh, Graciela, yeah, uh, one thing I'm, I'm hearing that I think I'd like to hear a little bit more on is this trusted partner. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that, um, you know, when, a, when there's issues that you know your electeds have to deal with and you know you've got specific information that would be very helpful to them, how you become a trusted partner where their staff contact you to make sure they understand what's happening in the community or get the facts or to get talking points. To me, that's a very powerful relationship where we can be very helpful, particularly in a time when there's, there's so much going on and people have to make so many decisions. I, I just think that's such a very strong point. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for, for noting that. Lakeisha, did you have a question? I saw that you that you unmuted. I just wanted to, to make sure. Yes, um, I had a question around what um, Denise just said about someone kind of presenting something at a, at a council meeting or asking, you know, a lot of times you're looking at RFPs and you're looking at like become being vendors of either city or county um, or, but, but I kind of want to understand more about like, for example, capital projects. Say you need like a location building, real estate, um, our funding for a specific program. Like how does that really look in terms of, you know, going to the city? Is it at the city council meeting? You know, do you email a proposal? Do you wait and become a vendor and wait until an RFP specifically comes out? Um, just a little bit more information on that because a lot of times you know, nonprofits are doing the work in like, say, for example, homelessness um, with students, um, you know, getting licensed for like STRTPs or non-public schools or, or special ed, you know, we're doing the work, but in terms of tapping into the money or tapping into the resources in terms of like the real estate, um, it's very hard. It's very, very, very difficult to know who to talk to, how to talk to them, you know, and how to kind of get in that loop. So that was a long question. <laughs> oh, that's great, Lakeisha. It's great to ask while we're in the, 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 the segment of it. Denise, if you wanted to go ahead and answer that. That's a great question. Um, and the answer is not ideal. The answer is it depends, right? It depends on the scope of the project, the size of the project. Um, I, I think that this goes back to what Stephen was just saying about building those trusted partnerships. And I think it's important to remember that it often doesn't happen overnight. It happens over time and developing those relationships can be, um, can be a long process sometimes. But I would say, you know, if, you, if you're the example that you gave around homelessness, uh, we just uh, voted on a transitional housing project for the first time in the city of Redlands. Some of the nonprofits that we're partnering with um, happen to be recommended to us by the county. So I think that's important to understand too, that there's oftentimes a city, county, and a county-state relationship to some of these larger projects, especially when we're talking about Project Home Key and getting state dollars for these types of programs. So in, in that example, you'd have to expand your network to not just the city, but to be working with the county probably as well. Um, and it certainly wouldn't hurt to meet with the relevant stakeholders at the city uh, for us, that would be the director of facilities and community services who's overseeing that particular project and working closely with our city manager. Um, but yeah, like, like I said in the, in the start of this answer, it, it definitely depends on the project. The other examples that I've been giving 
throughout um, this, this webinar have been really sort of smaller projects that have been proposed by nonprofits that are, you know, more artistic in nature. And, and at those, you know, in those examples, I think it's been really easy for them to come to me as a council member and for me to say to the city manager, let's put this on the agenda and vote on it, right? But it just really depends on, on the scope of the project. And I'm, I'm happy to put my information in the chat. And if there's ever um, any specific question you have offline, I'm happy to answer that as well. Of course, thank you so much, Denise. Go ahead, Italia. I did, oh yeah, I did want to add um, to the previous, well, to the question that we were on in terms of um, how nonprofits, particularly the small nonprofits can engage, right? When you don't have a lobbyist and such. And I think the critical part of this is making sure that um, in your, whether it's in your, under your community organizing portion or under your, you know, public policy, you know, department or, or even if it's not a department, but just, you know, your person, right? Or, or your executive director that they are building those uh, relationships with the staff and with the members themselves, right? With the elected officials themselves and with the staff members, right? And that sometimes, you know, can, you know, mean going to city council, right? And just staying afterwards and talking to them. And, or that can mean, you know, going to, um, you don't always have to be going to Sacramento. I think a lot of times there's that misconception, right? And so, you know, visiting in district, right? Scheduling those meetings, you know, having, uh, letting the, the elected officials know what your organization is up to, right? And also inviting them to your events, engaging them, and, you know, if you have, you know, maybe a, a, a Navidad, right, like we're on the holidays, right, if you have a holiday uh, dinner or a holiday party with your community members, you know, invite them over, let them know what, you know, let them see the work that you're doing firsthand, right, that they, they see the community members, that they see your volunteers, right. Uh, I know we, you know, you could do report cards, right, like we engaged this many volunteers this year and elected officials and, and, and public officials, I think, will appreciate that, right, they will see that you are indeed making an impact in the community that you're engaging people. And I think, you know, elected officials, particularly, you know, when it comes to their, their constituents, right, they want to see that people are engaged. And if they're engaged with your nonprofit, right, if even if you don't have the monies for uh, someone, a government affairs person or whatever, you know, under the organizations that I worked at, you know, a lot of the work fell, a lot of that work fell under civic engagement, right? And so it was a lot of myself, a lot of our volunteers, you know, they did lobby visits, they did all of these in, in house, right, in district, they didn't have to go to Sacramento or Washington necessarily, right? And all of those uh, efforts really go a long way when you do have perhaps a legislative proposal or a budget proposal of sorts, um, or, you know, any policy uh, proposal of sorts, because they're going to be able to see, okay, there's a trajectory of your community members, you know, they're, they're out there, they're volunteers, and you don't have to necessarily have a lot of money, you know, or a lobbyist to really make that change. And I think, I think Sam and others mentioned on this, it was the collaborative efforts as well. And so working with other organizations that perhaps do have those people up in Sacramento or up in Washington, right, and making sure that, hey, how do we push our, both of our mutual agendas forward and how do we broaden what, what the work that we're doing here in, you know, locally? Graciela, I, 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 you, uh, you were just reminding me, Italia, uh, uh, and thinking about Lakeisha's question, I think part of what a lot of people want to know who don't have professionals on their staff to do this kind of work, where do you actually start? Do you just like call? Do you text? Do you email? Do you send a letter? How do you, how do you begin the very first steps of introducing yourself and, and approaching with an ask? Where does that really start for somebody who's sitting at their desk with 20 things to do and trying to figure out how, how can I have that conversation to begin a relationship? Can we get really granular for just a moment? Yeah, I think um, to that point, I think it really depends and it goes back to having a strategy, right? You have to have, your organization has to have strategic goals, perhaps that you're trying to get through this year. So maybe your organization, I come from organizations that engage both the, the city, the county, the state, the federal government. And so how do you even, you know, begin it? You have to have a strategy. If this year your policy or your advocacy efforts or your uh, com the community is going to be pushing for some things, particularly in the county, you want to start focusing then on the county, for example, or on the city, whatever have you. 
right? And if you don't already have existing relationships with others and you want to start there, I think a great way to do it is really go to the meeting, right? If it's if it's a local meeting like county and city, go to the meeting, go to the council meeting, go to the supervisor's meeting and, you know, make sure that you ha- you take community members with you, that they start to see, put a face to the people that are making the decisions, right? If you have the opportunity to talk to them afterwards, introduce yourself, I think that's a great uh, start to find out also events that they are uh, hosting, right? A lot of the times council members host, you know, toy drives, you know, something that very community driven where they're going to be more accessible uh, in one way or another to the community. And I think that's going to, that's another uh, important piece where you can introduce yourself, say, hey, I'd love to have a meeting with you. I know a lot of the times that that happens, right? I'd love to schedule a meeting with you or your staff member. It's particularly for state and, and federal officials, it's, it's harder to get a meeting with the member themselves. But a, sta- a meeting with the staff member is, is as you know, as as a, as a staff member myself is, is as good, right? So, but if it's a local person, you know, I think they they tend to be more flexible and have and have more accessibility. A lot of them now because of COVID have office hours, virtual office hours, and so tune into those office hours, right? Introduce yourself. Hey, I want to talk to you know our organization, our nonprofit in this year. This are our our focus for this year. You know, 2022. This is going to be our priorities. Lay them out, and this is how we hope you know to work with the city, or to these are the projects that we hope to present to the city and to get support on. Sometimes they're not necessarily items that the council member or you know that specific person is going to have a say in, but they can advocate or support in other ways. It's not necessarily an item that might be in their agenda or that have needs to have action from them, but nonetheless, you know, they maybe they can, you know, point you to the right people, right, within the city or within other agencies. And I think it starts from there and it starts to also build report, right? Let them know, hey, you know, maybe a report, newsletters, right? Engage them, send them over to those members and their staff members. You know, this year we, you know, we've been able to do X, Y, and Z and 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 continue to do that. Be constant. I think that's another piece. Be constant. Don't just come in. I think at that touch on it. Don't just come in when you need something, right? Like, hey, when you know we're trying to, you know, stop this project or whatever have you. Know it. Be constant in your approach, and so that way, you know, you're you're really building those genuine relationships, that genuine report from yourself, whether you're the executive director or your point person, but also your volunteers. They are, you know, your volunteer base, your community folks. They are. Um, their voices are as powerful as any other person in the communities, particularly to elected officials, right? And th- those constituents that live in their district, that ward, you know, if it's very specific to the city council. Um, and I think that's a very, I come from the grassroots perspective, what we had to do, I had to wear a gazillion hats, right? And and do all of these things at the same time. And, and it really was that, just being very grassroots with very little or no money uh, at times, right? And and just going to those meetings, going to those events, you know, now people will start to recognize you. They'll start to recognize your volunteers, your your directors, your, you know, whatever positions people have in your nonprofit. And from there, you know, you start to build those relationships and, and they become genuine. Like I think Adan touched on that uh, very good. Yeah, thank you so much, Italia. Adan, I, I saw that, that you want to say- Real quick okay. here, Italia had all the heat. I'm just here to say, 101 plus 100 right but i i just want to quickly add here and say like a lot of this unfortunately is tit for tat right like if they do something for you like the electives you should also probably do something for them right like if they meet with you then afterwards you should be posting on social media thank you elected so and so for meeting with us it was a really great conversation right or like if they post about the conversation you had go into the comment section and be like thank you so much for meeting with us it was great right elected can't always make it to stuff, but they love to be invited to it, whether it's to attend, but certainly to speak, right? If there's an elected who has been like really championing an issue and you're gonna have an event sort of in that spirit, then you probably wanna invite the elected to speak. Even if they can't go, they'll invite a staffer if they have one, right? But the win is landing that invitation, right? Where it's, even if they can't come through, they appreciate you thinking about them. If you have so the capacity to honor people, it's great every now and then, it doesn't have to be super the super large gala or the super large award, but it could be a small recognition. Thank you for being our champion. Thank you for being our advocate. Here is a small certificate of recognition, or here is a thank you email, right, for everything you've done for us in the past year. Stuff like that really goes such a far way, right? And it's stuff that takes a couple of minutes, right? But like I said, can make the biggest difference. And I was just gonna, I, every what everyone's saying is really, really resonating with me, and I'm taking my own notes here too. 
but um, I know that sometimes also when you're thinking about just adding a little federal perspective, each federal, uh, each year, Senate, I know most folks are in California, your two senators are going to have state staff and then your uh, local congressman is also going to have a district specific staff. So it's, you know, that's usually around eight people, eight or nine people. Um, there is a front door, which is just to schedule a meeting, right? You can go to there if you go to websites um, or uh, email the scheduler, there's going to be a district scheduler or a, a DC scheduler. And that's the person who's going to figure out where the member is going to be, or uh, like Italia said, where the staff member is going to be if the member themselves can't be there. Um, I found, I mean, it sounds, I, I find the most um, direct way to get that information, like who, that Stephen asked that question, like who do I email, tends to be to pick up the phone and call the offices when you're dealing with federal elected officials and just, just not discount your voice as a constituent. Um, you are a constituent of that elected official and you're also doing great work in the community and you're an employer, you're activating volunteers, all that, but just fundamentally as a constituent uh, should be enough to just get that email address to know who to reach out to and then just start the conversation there and have a strategy happening in the background. All those perspectives are so amazing. And I think this brings up, to, goes to that next question that can really be for Adan and Sam um, from the perspective, and, we, and you touched a bit on it, from the perspective of the other side um, to get there, what are some strat strategies to the mapping and to identify? I think we, well, previously I, I mapped and um, and I we so me and Steven selected our, our key officials that we wanted to 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 chat with and who who would make the most impact. But we did find <laughs> Steven the <don't> color. <laughs> but um, we we did have some maybe some we didn't hear back from some folks, and um, we did the right steps. We did everything that we were supposed to do. Um, what should they do when, when they hit that, um, that curveball of not hearing back? Um, if that, if hopefully that, that's a good question to ask y'all. What Adan said um, kind of resonated with me too about like to show them the, to get, have them understand the work that you're doing. And so, you know, have that maybe reevaluate your request. Was your request for a meeting or was it for something specific? Was there an ask contained? And when that question of like, well, what is, why is the individual, the elected official incentivized to go partake? Yeah. And is it a real fun community event that's gonna be um, helping them better understand their community, get some good photos, um, learn about a different aspect uh, that can be helpful too. Um, so I think that that's, that's one thing to bear in mind. And then, you know, there's a level of persistence, probably. I, I find that uh, it's particularly if you're coming from a constituent perspective, that, you know, everyone is kind of run down, but it's not like they're ignoring, um, necessarily ignoring those requests. So appropriate follow ups or, or maybe when there's a what I like to do is when there's a relevant follow up, yeah. like maybe um, I emailed a staffer maybe a few months ago, and they never responded, which happens to me all the time. Um, I mean, often more times than not, they do respond, but, um, and then I just followed up because that congressman had gone to the, um, had been doing an event at uh, one of the local Ys in the district. So I kind of saw that on Twitter, used that tweet as a way to kind of, to follow back up, which felt sort of relevant. And there's always this weird, um, I'm always surprised, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but in DC, there's always sometimes a disconnect with the policy staff who are located here and like the district staff. But so that, even though that person is in charge of, let's say, their education policy for ex-congressmen, they might not really even be aware that the congressman visited this after-school site. So like helping connect those dots can be helpful. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I definitely agree. And I'm going to go ahead and sort of bring it back to a question you asked earlier about what we shouldn't do, right? Like my personal rule is to follow up with people two times. After that, I personally feel and what I've sort of heard and learned from others that like, clearly it's not working right to follow up via email, right? So then you're going to have to sort of think about, you know, what your other strategies are here. But then at the same time, you don't want to be, you don't want to follow up too, too much because that might burn the bridge. Then you'll sort of be known as sort of the annoying sort of order person within, you know, an office. And that's definitely not going to get you too, too far, right? But then exactly to like Sam's point, I've had sort of incidences where I try to follow up. I followed up twice, but it wasn't going nowhere. I was like, it's a lost cause, whatever. But then I saw this person at an event, right? And I was like, oh, hey, it's good to see you, blah, 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 blah. 
you don't even have to bring up the email because they know they ignored it right and then <laughs> and, and then they'll be they'll feel kind of bad so you have to like kind of you know guilt trip them into talking to you and they'll be like oh yes let's follow up and let's schedule a time boom they do it for you you didn't have to do anything you just had to sort of say hi and be courteous in person right um the other thing I'll sort of share here too is that in addition to sort of, you know, knowing when to follow up and using sort of other strategies to follow up, you know, at some point you might want to leverage other people in your network. Hey, oh, you have a good relationship with that office? Well, you know, it could be that they're going to listen to them, right? And you use this sort of as a way to get in there or, oh, I try to contact so-and-so. They're not there or they're not the key staffer because, you know, there are different staffers who work across many issues, right? Sometimes it's just knowing the right person, right? They're like, oh, well, if you have the contact info, I'd appreciate it. And then you could be sort of more strategic in your approach, right? So I think that some of these things certainly do also make a difference. And I just want to pick that leveraging is, oh, go ahead, Sam. I was just going to elevate what Atalia said earlier about like, who is your actual champion? And it doesn't, you might think that this, your council member and your direct elected, like your member of Congress in your district has to be your champion. But, you know, if they're not responsive, then they can't be. So exactly. Kind of broad, yeah, to broaden that perspective and say, well, maybe there is someone else or maybe some other connected, maybe this person's personal story makes them more well sorted, suited to your cause, even though they're not geographically um, representing you. And what I'll say too is, that like you know even if they're not your champion now who knows if they might come around right but it's okay for not everybody to be your champion that's not always going to be the case but what I've seen sort of going back to sort of this peer pressure if there's other sort of people working with you and talking about you well guess what this person's probably going to feel bad for not doing the same and then they're sort of going to be like guilt trip to want to work with you right like if somebody starts talking about a particular <laughs> subject and they're not sort of engaging that they'll want to sort of engage too. And that's really great news for you because you've sort of done your due diligence to engage others. And then that way, it's just sort of a domino effect here. So, the, the, uh, the, you know, the, you, there's two things in, in my mind that, that you brought up to me. I remember one day when I was running a national organization and we were having trouble with a particular senator who had some ideas about, um, special ed and I was running UCP and we couldn't quite get the staff's attention. And I brought it up at the board meeting and one of my board members said, oh, you know, I did two fundraisers for that Senator. I know him quite well. And then another person on the board said, oh, you know, I was an intern in his office a few years back and I'm going, well, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. Why didn't I ask this question before? Uh, it, it, it was just amazing to me that you, we have all these people in our universe and we don't use them very well for this because a third party validator, a third party that does the introduction can be so much stronger. It's, it's just a, amazing to me. So I have a, another quick uh, question and that is we've been in a, a, a number of us here in the Inland Empire where we're working have been looking at how ARPA funds are flowing through the cities, the counties, the states, uh, how they are designated for certain uh, categories, including what many of us are, which are small businesses or not-for-profits and often both. Uh, we are also looking at the bill, uh, the infrastructure bill and how that's going to flow and who's going to be making the decisions. And of course, there's the Build Back Better Act, which we'll see what that looks like, maybe. <laughs> but we've been really trying to study how that's flowing, who's making the decisions, how the programs are going to be created. And we feel like that, that in some cases, some of these programs are going to be new, new programs. And we know a lot of folks in, in our government are really overworked. And we'd like to help use our expertise in figuring out how to get the money to the right people and get spent in the right way. Because if these bills don't do what they were intended to do, there's gonna be a huge backlash. And we're also very interested in bringing more money in the community. I'd love to hear any of your advice on how we can be helpful, how we can be meaningful, and how we can succeed in, in, um, in getting that money appropriately and well used. 
big question, but I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, 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 Graciela, why don't you call on them? They're all gonna sit there uh, thinking. I think I, I can sort of start a little bit on that conversation just because okay. of, um, yeah, just because of, you know, the way that the state has been doing a lot of things. But I, I think from from a community and, and, and both and the elected office perspective is really having a plan. I think a lot of the times, uh, perhaps we're not used to getting, you know, these surpluses or these funds or these additional things that we were counting on, you know, perhaps cities or counties are not. Uh, yet prepared, you know, to present a plan. And I think that's one of the biggest things is have a plan ready, uh, a specific plan, you know, really know if you're, if you're asking for X, Y, and Z dollars, right? What are you going to do with that money, right? Have present, come to the table with your request, with the plan. And I think uh, that goes, you know, for nonprofits as well. If a lot of nonprofits, um, you know, are working with the counties, for example, specifically on, on housing issues and a lot of these things that um, nonprofits can benefit from, and you know they need to come to the entity that they're asking, or they're going to be partnering or collaborating with, with the plan on how they're going to be using those funds. And I, I think that's one of the things that a lot of the times, um, specifically in the nonprofit sector, you know, we're like, hey, just give us the money. We'll know what to do with it, right? <laughs> like we there's a need, and nobody, you know, we all know there's a need. The need is there, and that the nonprofit sector is really take up and, and do the heart and the heavy lifting in the community. But nonetheless, I think having that strategy, if you know your nonprofit specifically advocates for, you know, housing or, you know, they're they're, you know, if they're working or collaborating with other um, agencies to ensure, you know, that these funds go directly to the community in one way or another, then be strategic on that. And and perhaps, you know, your own nonprofit is not going to be able to do all of the heavy lifting. And that's where the collaboration, I think Sam and others touched on. The collaboration with the nonprofit. Maybe there's a larger nonprofit that already has this infrastructure, that already has maybe a really, uh, you know, strong grant, you know, writers or you know, finance folks, and they can put together a budget proposal, right? And so all of those things really, I feel like, are going to be critical, and they're always critical because it's like, okay, if you're going to get this money, we really need to know how you're going to use it and have a, a plan ready in terms of if you're going to be, uh, you know, under, if the county is going to give you the money, right, or if the state's going to give the county the money and the county's going to give the nonprofit the money, then you got to go through all the hoops, you know, the, the nonprofit has to have the vetting from the county and the approval. So that way, when they present it to the state, you know, the state is like, hey, yes, you know, you're good to go. Uh, and so, and the same thing for the cities, right, the cities, when they're requesting for funds and when there is funds coming in, it's like, hey, look, we, we really got to know what, what's going to happen with the money. Well said, Natalia. Um, the only thing I'll add to that is that the time is now. We just got a briefing this week on um, our staff's you know, outline of potential uses for the ARPA funds. And so we'll be voting on that early next year as a council. Um, so definitely the time is now to get your plans together and to employ all the strategies we've been talking about in terms of building those connections and relationships. My, um, my worry wart nature feels it prudent to add to also be just mindful of COVID, a lot of the COVID relief dollars are time limited funds. They can't, they don't last in perpetuity. They're not intended to. So I think that's helpful in number one, you as a nonprofit making your case for how you plan to spend it, but also just something to be aware of. Similarly, um, Stephen mentioned the Build Back Better Act. A lot of those uh, new programs um, that oftentimes uh, a few of them include state matches or um, partnerships in that way. You want to just be mindful of like the um, ecosystem of setting up a new like entitlement program around, let's say, childcare. That's what it does. Sorry, there's an ambulance. Thank you so much. Those were really valuable answers. Um, I just wow, we are at time already. Um, but thank you all for answering those questions and. I sometimes I didn't even have to go through all the questions because y'all answered them very naturally. So thank you so much. Um, and let's go ahead and jump into Q and A. And if there's no questions, that's that's completely okay as well because we did answer a lot of hefty questions. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll leave it open for the participants if they have if they want to add anything in the chat or just unmute yourself. Feel free to do that. So I had a question and I'll, I'll kick this off for just a second. And uh, one of them is that, um, you know, when, when we're working with an organization, one of our biggest concerns is how we tell our story, how we pitch ourselves, how we 
tell the stories that tell our story. And, um, and sometimes I will listen to folks talk about what they're doing and I'm not sure when I'm done or I'm not sure what point they're trying to make. Do you have any you know, advice? I know this is a little out of sync, but do you have any advice on how organizations like ours talk about their essential services and still give a little heart to it in a way that you, you can hear and do something with? Ooh, that's a terrible question. But I, I mean, if you can make sense out of it, I would love to hear any of your responses. I think maybe I can even add to that as well. Um, you, you'll you find that we actually, um, we met Italia actually by having that one-on-one -on -one conversation. And we actually set up a call with Italia and Italia got back to us um, rather quickly. We scheduled the call and we shared our mission, what we were doing, what what's next. And that relationship was created um, through Italia we then met um, Adan and then through that connection and then through one of our board members, that's how we met Sam and Denise is actually one of our seed lab fellows. And I guess it comes back to like that huge testament of we shared our story and your story is super pow is incredibly powerful and that's how you can create a, a, a huge relationship. Um, and and that's, a, that's just, a, the, I just wanted to note that because I was thinking about that and I was like, wait a minute, everything that we're talking about, you know, it's a true testament of, of you know, what y'all are saying and what, how to completely get there. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think to, to add a little bit to that, um, I really, the public, the narrative and the, the, the narrative building really comes, it's a core of the nonprofit work that um, I recall doing specifically around like immigrant rights issues, right? I remember you know, over, over 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when we were talking about immigration reform, we were trying to build a narrative that uh, people would support, right? We were trying to break away from certain stereotypes of immigrants. We were trying to change, really change the narrative, redirect the narrative. And I think that a lot of times needs to happen for the nonprofits. I think a lot of the times, specifically nonprofits that have been in uh, this type of work or they've been, you know, standing for a long time, they might be stuck on the same type of narrative, right? And so sometimes you need to go back and redefine what does that, what does your mission mean now? And what does that mean for people now, for communities now, for electeds now? And how do you also, uh, you know, change it, right? I think the narrative, and, and when you talk about, and I recall, you know, when you work with community, right, building their own narrative too, right? And and it's a story of self, us, and now, right? That 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 similar concept of, how do you pivot your story? How do you pivot your nonprofit's work to ensure that you are being relevant in the work that you're doing, right? And so I think if you are engaging with elected, you know, if you have a budget ask, if you have something specific, you gotta pivot your narrative to make it relevant to what you're trying to advocate for. If you are, you know, um, working with the community, right? How do you then pivot that? And so I think that's a part of a lot of the times is is evolving, right? Evolving into what are the needs now and how do we, what are the projections as well? How, where do we see as a nonprofit, where do we see ourselves 10 years from now? And how do we ensure that our narrative continues to fit those projected goals or the projected um, you know, missions that we have ahead of us? Oh, that's, that's great. Let me, you know, when you're talking, I think about the history of the why and how over the last decade, they really turned your positioning. You had to redefine the YMCA. Uh, when you went back to really working with kids in the communities, and, and this is, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but vis-a-vis -vis high-end gyms in the middle of the cities. And I, I just think it was an amazing chore. Um, you know, I, everybody has been so good. We had a nice turnout, good people here. Uh, our speakers, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Very cool uh, to meet you and get to know you here. Uh, and I thought we got to some really good material stuff. I've got a page of notes myself. And I think it, and we may have to publish a piece on this, uh, Graciela, because I think there's a lot of people who we could do a briefing on about this call that would really appreciate it. And thank you for all your kind comments, by the way, from everyone. And Graciela, thank you for uh, um, uh, 
being the host for this and running it as you usually do so well. Uh, we haven't seen each other for a while because of distance yeah. and, and uh, we're in different parts of the world at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, thanks everybody for being here. It's great to see uh, all, all of these folks and uh, our special friends as well that keep coming back. So we'll, we'll end now. Anything else you need to say, Graciela? Yeah, um, just one last thing. Um, this, this recording will be um, available. Um, I'm not sure when, but we'll make it available and we'll go ahead and, and share it um, just so y'all can go ahead and share it um, to our nonprofit folks or just um, um, community members. Feel free to share it out. We do understand it is the end of the month and we do know that a lot of folks are on holiday and, um, and going on vacation. Um, so we do um, know that this conversation is super valuable and just we want to make it as accessible as possible for everyone. So that's why we offer it. Um, they, Steven said it best. Thank y'all so much. And um, we're so excited. And who knows, maybe we might do another one, another one of these, right? I think it'd be extremely valuable. And we can invite more folks and have the same folks here because um, thank you, Denise, Sam, Adan, Italia. Y'all have been so pivotal and truly um, what we stand for. And that's creating change. And y'all are the future change makers and are the change makers right now. So thank you so much and we'll be in touch and thank you all for your sweet comments, um, direct messaging me, telling me how valuable this conversation has been. And so we'll be in touch and it, how Denise said now, the time is now for the ARPA funds and let's, you know, let's start um, making our plans. Alrighty y'all, take care. Have a great night. <laughs>